This lesson is just math. There's no physics in it, but it's really useful math. Here we're going to learn how we can treat quantities that have directions, which a lot of interesting things in physics do, such as your position, your velocity, forces are all directed, and vectors give us a way to talk about that quantitatively. What I want you to get from this is to be able to understand what vectors and scalars are, what their use is, what the difference is between them, and what kinds of quantities are vectors, what kinds of quantities are scalars. Then I want you to learn how to do a few mathematical operations with vectors, so you'll be able to add vectors, subtract vectors from each other, and multiply them by scalars. The reason we're doing this is because a lot of physical quantities have direction. Here we have a way to quantify the direction and also to talk about how these types of quantities with directions combine with each other. A vector is a quantity that needs a direction to fully specify it. So a vector basically has two pieces of information in it. it, has a direction and a magnitude, which is how big it is. Then a scalar doesn't have a direction. It might have a magnitude, it has a bigness to it. Both vectors and scalars can have units or they can be unitless. One simple way to represent vectors is graphically as arrows. You just draw an arrow. The direction of the vector is given by the direction of the arrow. So the arrow head is the direction that the vector is pointing. The magnitude of the vector is going to be represented by the length of the arrow. This is a perfect correspondence if you're talking about a position or a displacement vector starting in one spot, ending somewhere else. But vectors can be things like velocities, forces, which don't have a specific spot on a picture. But here we can use them to conceptually and graphically understand what we've got. Where a vector is, is irrelevant. Two vectors with the same direction and magnitude, even if they're drawn in different places, are identical. Now, if we want to be more quantitative, we can represent vectors by their components. If we have a vector, we can project it onto perpendicular component axes. The x and y axes are what we usually call our axes when we're working in two dimensions. Here I've defined a horizontal axis as x and a vertical axis as y. We can characterize vectors in this plane by what their extent is in the x or horizontal direction and what their extent is in the vertical or y direction. So here, for instance, I've got two vectors a and b. Vector a is 4 comma 3, so it's 4 in the x direction, the horizontal direction, and 3 in the vertical direction. b doesn't have any extent in the horizontal direction, but in the vertical extension it goes down by 2, so we can call that negative 2. So we can express these vectors as ordered pairs, and the elements in the ordered pair tell us the x and y components of the vectors. This is very similar to describing vectors by their decomposition into unit vectors. The unit vector, which is a vector with length of 1 and no units, unit vector i hat, has a length of 1 in the x direction, the j hat vector has a length of 1 in the y direction, and the k hat vector has a length of 1 in the z direction. The little hat thing denotes not only that it's a vector, but that it's a unit vector. Any vector can be described as a linear combination of different unit vectors. So for instance here, I have the x component times the i hat vector, the y component times the j hat vector, the z component times the k hat vector. And that's an equivalent way of writing the ordered triple now, x, y, z. Another convention for representing vectors is as polar coordinates. You specify it by a magnitude and an angle. In two dimensions, that's very simple. You only need one angle to describe it. In three dimensions, you need a different convention of specifying your angle, and that's beyond the scope of this class. We, in this class, I'll generally use the trigonometric convention to specify an angle. The trigonometric convention is that you measure your angle counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. So here's the two vectors a and b that we described earlier. Vector a has a magnitude of 5. Its direction is 36.87 degrees, counterclockwise of the positive x-axis. Vector b, remember, which is magnitude of 2, and it's straight down, that's 270 degrees. The magnitude is 2. Sometimes we are given the vector in one of these notations, and we need to convert it to another notation. So here I'll talk about how to do conversions from the polar notation to Cartesian notation and from the Cartesian notation to the polar notation.
So here I've got some vector that's in the green with a length r. It's got components in the x and y direction and some angle theta counterclockwise of the positive x-axis. First I'll talk about converting from the polar coordinates, magnitude and angle, to the Cartesian coordinates, which are the horizontal and vertical components. So the x component is going to be r, the magnitude, times the cosine of the angle theta. The y component is r times the sine of the angle theta. Going from the Cartesian coordinates to the polar coordinates is almost as easy. The easy part is getting the magnitude. The square of the magnitude of any vector is just the sum of the squares of the components. The angle is a little tougher. One thing we can say unequivocally is that the tangent of the angle theta is given by the y component divided by the x component. Unfortunately, that doesn't uniquely specify what the angle theta is itself. The problem is there's two angles in the unit circle for every arctangent. The arctangent function will return an angle that's between negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees of the positive x-axis. For every angle in that region, there is an opposite angle that has exactly the same tangent. If your vector has an x component that's negative, the way you find that angle is to take the arctangent just as before, but then you add 180 degrees to that arctangent. Position, displacement, velocity, acceleration, and force are physical quantities that we've already described, and those all have directions that are important. Those quantities are all vector quantities. Two quantities that we've used a lot that are not vectors are mass and time. They don't have axes. They don't have separate directions. There's nothing to specify with that. Time just goes forward, but we do not have a second axis of time. Thank God I had no idea what that would mean if we did. As we go along, we'll get lots more quantities, uh, both that are vectors and scalars. Back to vectors. I said I wanted to teach you how to do some operations with vectors. Now we'll talk about addition of vectors. You add vectors head to tail. So here if I've got vectors a and b, if you want to add these together to get their sum, vector c, you start with vector a, and then you put the tail of vector b, the beginning of vector b, at the ending, the head of vector a. If you can imagine walking along uh, displacement vectors, so you walk along a, you go that vector, and then you walk along b, and what you've done is you've started here and ended here. So the sum is the vector that starts at the beginning of a, and ends where it ends. Vector a plus vector b gives you vector c. c is known as the vector sum or the resultant vector. So adding vectors graphically is quite simple. You place the following vector's tail at the preceding vector's head, and then the resultant starts where the first vector starts and ends where the last vector ends. In doing this, you can chain as many vectors together as you want. You just place each vector the beginning at the head of the previous vector. I'm not going to make this into an ed puzzle because there aren't that many questions. But now imagine that we have these different vectors, a and b. So now a is a vertical vector, b is mostly to the right and a little bit down, diagonally. So if we were to add together vectors a plus b, which one of these choices would you end up with? I hope you decided that you'd end up with A, because if you draw this, something like this, the resultant vector would start here and go here, and the closest to that is this one. What do you think? Is vector addition commutative? What I mean by commutative is that the order of the elements doesn't matter. So vector A plus B would have to be the same thing as vector b plus a in all cases if vector addition were to be commutative. It turns out that vector addition is commutative. We can geometrically prove that pretty simply by understanding some properties of parallelograms. So let's say we've got our same vectors a and b again. So if we're going to draw a plus b this way to give vector c like we did before, the other way to do it would be to draw vector b and then add vector a to it. And we can see that this is a parallelogram, that opposite sides are 
parallel to each other. And geometrically, we know that these are going to end up at the same place. Yes, indeed. Vector a plus vector b is the same thing as vector b plus vector a. For any vectors a and b, vector addition is commutative. We've seen how to represent vectors by their components. It turns out that using components is a very powerful and easy way to add vectors together. And the way you do that is you add the different components individually. So you add the x components, you add the y components, and if there is a third dimension to your vectors, you add the z components. And those sums of components give you the resultant vectors. So for instance, here we're starting with vector a, which recall is 4 comma 3, and adding to it vector b, which is 0 comma negative 2. If we add those together, the x component is going to be 4 plus 0. The y component is going to be 3 plus negative 2, or 3 minus 2. So the resultant vector is 4 comma 1, and we see, sure enough, 4 comma 1 gives us graphically exactly what it should be. It really is vector a plus vector b. Now, you can't just add any vectors together. For a vector sum to be meaningful, the vectors have to be the same kind of quantity. They have to have the same units. So it's just like working with scalars. If you add 5 seconds and 10 seconds, you get 15 seconds. That's perfectly legit. That works fine. If you try to add 5 kilograms plus 10 meters, you can't say that's 15 anything, because kilograms and meters aren't the same thing. They don't have a common factor. So that's not OK. This is universal for algebra in general, of course. 5a plus 10a gives you 15a. They've got a common factor of a. You can add together the coefficients. But if you have 5b plus 10c, that doesn't give you 15 anything. Well, if we have addition of vectors, how would subtraction work? The way we work subtraction is, if you want to say vector a minus vector b, what you do is vector a plus the negative of vector b. What's the negative of a vector? Well, the negative of a vector is a vector with the same magnitude, but opposite direction. In other words, its direction is 180 degrees off from your original vector. If you think about it, that makes perfect sense, because if you add a vector to its negative, you end up where you started. That's the 0 vector. So let's say we have vectors a and b. If I wanted to do a minus b, then I would have to also define vector negative b. Vector a minus vector b is just vector a plus negative of vector b. So I'll call that vector d. Vector d equals vector a minus vector b, or vector a plus the negative of vector b. What about scalar multiplication? Scalar multiplication of a vector just means that you multiply the vector by a scalar. When you do that, the product is a vector. What the scalar does is change the magnitude of the vector, but it doesn't do anything to the direction. With the exception that if the scalar is negative, then that just will reverse the direction of the vector. For instance, here, if I've defined this as vector a, 2 times vector a is a vector that's twice as long, twice the magnitude, but in the same direction. Negative 2 times vector a, that's twice as long, but in the opposite direction. 1 half times vector a, well, that's half as long as vector a, and it's in the same direction, and so on. An example of when that comes up in physics, with the kind of systems that we've looked at already, is if you multiply velocity times time. Velocity is a vector, time is a scalar. A sum velocity times a change in time gives you a change in position. These are different kinds of quantities. However, this change in position, delta r, is in the same direction as v. So the velocity gives you the direction of the position change. The vectors are in the same direction, but they have different units here.